beginnings of post-war nuclear defence policy really you can chart to the Attlee government. And Attlee and senior ministers took a basic decision in 1947 to develop Britain's first nuclear weapons. It's unpleasant to all of us to have to devote so much of our resources to defence. But it's possible really to trace back that decision to a number of wartime and pre-war attitudes and dispositions. Britain always regarded itself in this period as a nuclear pioneer. Britain had its own atomic bomb project at the very beginning of the Second World War. It would have been British scientists, engineers and technicians which had played a really important part in the development of the Manhattan Project, the American Bomb Project. In the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, Britain thought itself also very vulnerable to potential um, threat from aerial attack from a future adversary. And because there's no NATO alliance formed until 1949, um, the United States appears to be withdrawing from commitments to defend Western Europe. It's pulling, it's pulling out its troops um, the, um, from, from Western Europe that had been there at the end of the Second World War. And that's combined with the wartime experience of being bombed. Preceded by a shower of flares, German bombers rain fire and high explosive bombs in their most savage attack on London. British are left in the position after 1946 of having to go it alone if they had to have any nuclear program at all, because in 1946 the US Congress passes something called the McMahon Act, which cuts down, in fact eliminates almost entirely Anglo-American nuclear cooperation and collaboration. Um, the situation changed quite fundamentally in 1958, um, when an Anglo-American agreement uh, was reached, which is still in force today. It's important to remember that the post-war nuclear program begun by the Attlee government was essentially a secret program. But there's no public announcement, there's no big fanfare made about a nuclear program. Parliament isn't kept informed about levels of expenditure, for example. So when Churchill comes back into office as the Conservative Prime Minister in 1951, he's actually quite astonished. Britain was on the verge of testing its first nuclear weapon, something which happened in October 1952 um, in the Montebello Islands off the northwest coast of Australia. And there is continuity between Labour and Conservative governments in their attitude towards keeping up this national nuclear weapons capability. The first generation of British nuclear weapons will be carried by aircraft. Now the V-bomber force, although very advanced for its day, was increasingly seen by the end of the 1950s as vulnerable on its airfields to attack from Soviet ballistic missiles. Blue Streak was designed to be um, available for use um, from about the middle 1960s onwards. The missile itself was seen as vulnerable, potentially vulnerable to Soviet preemptive attack because it would be located on fixed land sites in Britain. Um, it was a liquid fueled missile, so it would take a long time to fuel up, so it could not be fired very quickly. So the government in 1960 decides to cancel Blue Streak and instead acquire Skybolt from the United States. Skybolt was a ballistic missile that was air-launched, that would be launched from Britain's V-bombers. But what it did, this decision to cancel Blue Streak, was to the Labour Party, which by now in opposition, it signaled a moment when Britain really is not independent anymore as a nuclear power. Britain is becoming increasingly dependent on the United States, dependent for technology, dependent on nuclear materials, and dependent upon delivery systems. Now in 1962, the Skybolt missile program is cancelled by the Kennedy administration. And this marks a real crisis moment for the future of the British deterrent. A lot of people here are worried about our relations with the United States. Of course, any partners are bound to have their differences now and then. I've always found it so. A true partnership is based upon respect. So Macmillan goes to the Nassau Conference and meets um, President Kennedy and does a deal with Kennedy where he agrees to supply Polaris, a substitute ballistic missile to Britain that could be launched from a submarine. The advantage of submarine force, as far as the British are concerned, is, is, is its invulnerability to detection. Think of the peoples of Europe. I firmly believe that it is our destiny to work more and more closely with them. Well, at various times in Britain's nuclear story, British Prime Ministers in particular have been drawn to 
and attracted to the notion of closer collaboration and cooperation with France, particularly at that moment, those moments of British political history where Britain's relationship with Europe seems to be getting closer, but it never really took off, and it never really took off because the technical links and the contacts and the exchanges with the Americans had been forged first. And also British defence scientists, they know and understand the United States is a lot further ahead, of course, in its nuclear program than, than any other country. Now, during the late 1960s and early 1970s, the official position of the Labour Party was that Polaris would be the very last nuclear system. By the late 1970s, in the final years of the Labour government led by James Callaghan, work, however, is ongoing on what a successor system to Polaris might look like. And the conclusion that, that, was, that was arrived at was that another submarine-launched ballistic missile system purchased from the United States should be the successor. And that system was, of course, uh, the Trident system, the Trident system that um, the United Kingdom now has. Once nuclear weapons have been given up, it is almost impossible to get them back. And the process of creating a new deterrent takes many decades. And it would be an act of gross irresponsibility to lose the ability to meet such threats by discarding the ultimate insurance against those risks in the future. The whole process of renewing your nuclear deterrent can be a very, very long-winded one. A long process of deciding on what your most appropriate successor system will be, first of all, because defence planners have to try and anticipate the threats. Then they have to go about deciding what makes most political sense about the source of that platform, which country, perhaps which supplier, the, the process of political approval for the decisions that are made, um, the costing, the provisional costings attached to the decisions they want to make. They have to make sure the infrastructure to, to support the successor system is there. Crews have to be trained, people personnel have to be trained on new systems. All this takes an enormous amount of time, many, many, many years. In contemporary discussions about the renew, potential renewal of the UK nuclear deterrent, you hear moral arguments about relying on nuclear weapons for your defence policy um, on the left of British politics, on, you know, in parts of the Labour Party as well. But you know, you've got to remember that official Labour Party policy is still to renew Trident, the renew the Trident system. The Conservative Party, for many, many years, going back to the 1950s, has really wedded itself to maintaining an independent UK nuclear deterrent. What tends to predominate in debates over whether to renew or not have been more pragmatic considerations over cost. And that's certainly proving to be the case currently where you look at the escalating costs of Trident renewal. When there is only one prime contractor, the strongest argument people hold against um, stepping off the conveyor belt, if you like, is that you can't get back on it. Mm. You know, once you go out of this business, that's it. It's so difficult to revive. When you think about how long it would take to train, um, you know, a nuclear scientist who knows how, you know, warheads work and how this stuff works, it take, you know, take a decade. But if the order did come through from Downing Street, might you not pause for a moment and think, this is lunacy? I have to do it. Uh, there is no point in having nuclear weapons if I'm not prepared to do it. By being terrible, we persuade people not to attack us. The moral arguments are met by those who feel differently by saying, well, is it more moral to fight wars, which would lead to the deaths of thousands of thousands, if not millions of people, when nuclear weapons, you know, have prevented those wars taking place? Of course, there's a big gap between, there's a big leap between those two positions. I mean, the Cuban Missile Crisis, they step back from the brink because they realise if they go any further, they're going to, you know, gonna, it's going to result in a, in a global nuclear war. A sudden, clandestine decision to station strategic weapons for the first time outside of Soviet soil is a deliberately provocative and unjustified change in the status quo, which cannot be accepted by this country. But then the critics of nuclear weapons will say, well, yeah, the very reason that crisis happened is because these things were being deployed and, you know, played around with. Britain's always had this conception, I think, um, of itself as, as a great power, as, as a power which um, um, has a, a major role to play in international affairs, global affairs, um, and that's reflected in its uh, being one of the permanent five members of the Security Council. The sense that Britain's role in world affairs is somehow underpinned 
by its nuclear status is a really, really important consideration. It's well within the NATO alliance, it's well within European affairs, its relations with France, with the United States. Britain is given a certain stature and a standing by its possession of nuclear capability. And that means it's another very important reason why it's so difficult for, for British um, officials and ministers to, to contemplate um, Britain um, opting out of the nuclear game.